So um, I'm, my name is Gavin Phillips. I'm, a, I'm an academic member of staff at the university and um, I work within an academic faculty called Science and Engineering and I'm uh, an academic with the Crest team. So I work with uh, Vicky Jane and the team too in the lab and we're, we're looking at managing Shropshire at Telford and Reekin. Um, I'm not based in Shropshire, so I'm based up in Ellesmere Port at a place called Thornton Science Park, although I have projects obviously down in, down in Shropshire at the moment. And we are currently at the site of the former Shell Technology Centre at uh, Stanlow Oil Refinery, where the university started its faculty back in 2014 when the university bought uh, Shell Technology Centre for a pound plus VAT. Um, and that's where my labs are based. So I'm going to briefly, briefly bore you with what 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 I think a university is um, and how really just to give you a little bit of context about, you know, what what drives universities and a, a way I think of how universities work is that, is that we work in three areas, but we try to do we try to overlap as much as possible. So obviously universities think, you know, most people think universities, you know, they teach degrees. Yeah. And, and obviously we do do that. And, and I would I would call that part of our knowledge dissemination activity. So we we take current knowledge. We we take, you know, all the things that we know as humans on this planet and we disseminate them. We, we educate. We work with industry. We try to we try to um, put knowledge obviously in people's heads and in people's practice and send them out into the world. Alongside that, we to be a university, really you have to be generating new knowledge. You have to be investigating things that people have not investigated before in context they've not done that work before to generate that knowledge. And hopefully, in combination with this generation of knowledge and three areas, but we try to do which can help exploit that knowledge to make a society, to improve society, to generate economic growth and i suppose that's part of what crest is doing here so we're trying we're trying to help we're trying to use my knowledge i suppose and my expertise in concert with yours to exploit that and to and to leverage that and and really create some economic growth and you know we don't do it out of the goodness of our heart either we we want you know as nick was just saying at the beginning you know we we want to create opportunities for our students. We want your businesses to grow in the areas where we teach our students and we want our students to go out into the world and earn a good living and to contribute to the society that they live in. So a little bit about um, the Faculty of Science Engineering. So as I've said, we've, we're based at Ellesmere Port. We're in Chester and we're in Shrewsbury. Um, we teach a number of um, degrees in science. So we teach chemistry and physics. We teach chemical engineering. We have an apprenticeship in industry process plant engineering, which is mathematics, and we teach a number of computer science degrees. And then we have a number of taught master's degrees and research degrees. So that's enough about the university. So um, on to uh, my research area, really, and what we came um, to speak about today. And it's mainly, I suppose, about air pollution. Um, and you know why? Why is air pollution important? Why? Why does society care about it? And why does why do researchers care about it? And why you know why should you care about it? Well, current estimates are that there are approximately forty thousand deaths annually um, attributable to outdoor air pollution, with a with a significant number additionally um, linked to pollution in the indoor environment. And we're looking at costs. I mean, there are large error bars on these costs that. As with any economic estimates, of you know, 20 billion um, a year to society, and and in addition to these 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 deaths, there is lot um, effects on long-term health, um, cost to the NHS, uh, costs in lost worker productivity, and and in schools and in universities, uh, it impacts the ability of students to to learn effectively. So so. Those are the main sort of reasons, I suppose, the, the, the high level reasons why we care about air quality. But of course, this year, the elephant in the room, you know, is COVID-19. And that's really impacted my field quite a lot and, and really made this issue salient to a lot of people. 
So if we if we just look at that, take a second to look at that. So the the impact of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, we've got 100,000 deaths, you know, cost to the economy of 250 billion plus. Now, ordinarily, outside a pandemic, we have about 10,000 deaths a year from seasonal flu with about 40,000 hospital admissions per year in England, leading to 100 million in hospital costs. Yeah. So these airborne diseases outside of a pandemic um, are responsible for a significant fraction of sick days, uh, obviously leading to productivity loss in society, in society and the economy. And of course, as you all probably know, ve ventilation is a really important factor um, in the transmission of airborne viruses in the indoor environment. So, so if your indoor environment is poor, you, you can facilitate the transmission of these airborne viruses. So in addition to these issues surrounding air pollution itself and breathing air that is poor in quality, we have additional issues uh, because of biological transmission of viruses and, and bacteria, common colds, flus, and of course this year COVID-19. So what, what is happening in society and, and in government? Well, you know, as, as many of you know, we, there's, we've got this issue whereby many and many, many of us are working at home and lots of businesses would like to return to the office and lots of people are very worried about returning to the office. And in the context of indoor environments and how they impact the risk of disease transmission and more broadly, um, the health of occupants in buildings and their productivity, there's a lot of worry about that area. In concert with that, we've got this path to net zero and the green green buildings agenda. So we're, we're trying to we're trying to you know reach net zero by 2050 or whenever it is when the government is is saying we're going to get there. And um, we're looking at you know retrofit more energy efficient buildings. Um, how how does that impact the indoor environment? Because naively, one might think uh, they were in. Um, they were at loggerheads possibly because obviously increased ventilation, improving health, improving the health of indoor environments costs more money. Um, and you've got you've got more broadly globally, for example, you've got the European Commission's New Green Deal, which is aiming to get to zero toxics in the environment. So obviously the UK has, has its own env uh, environmental legislation looking to reduce air pollution. Um, but toxics are not just air pollution, they are volatile organic compounds, they, um, like in buildings, formaldehyde, for example. And so we've got this drive to lower the exposure, uh, our exposure to toxic com compounds. And many of you probably know the, the changes, that, the proposed changes to Part F, the building regulations have got, have got mandated indoor sensing, for example. So, so we've, got, we've got a lot of issues that are coming together um, in this area of, of the built environment and, and air quality. So what what are we looking at when we say the indoor environment and, and exposure to pollutants? So I've done a, I've done a very simple cartoon here and, and illustrated some of the some of the processes that occur uh, in the indoor environment. So obviously we have we have infiltration of air through cracks in buildings and through through leaky windows, for example, and leakage of air out. We have indoor activities like we might have space heating, like wood burners. We might have pets that release dander and allergens. We, we will have um, resuspension of dust particles from carpets and flooring, for example. We might have emissions of volatile organic compounds from paints or building materials like wood or sealants. We have, we have cleaning activities in buildings that emit compounds. We have activities like cooking, which emits a lot of, a lot of um, material. And then all together, these, these interact together and mix. And in concert with chemistry, they can produce further toxic molecules. So I've highlighted a number of um, substances of interest when it, when it comes to indoor air. So one of, one of the largest sources of harm in the indoor environment is particulate matter. And, and there are a large number of sources of that, such as, such as outdoor air infiltration, so vehicle exhaust or buildings in urban environments alongside roads or near, near industrial activity. 
we've got cooking activities produce particulate matter. A molecule of interest, formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is very interesting because whilst many people obviously in the building trades know that it, it's emitted by building materials and you, you need to you need to look at uh, formaldehyde emission indoor spaces from the building itself. Additionally, formaldehyde is produced by the chemistry of volatile organic compounds in indoor spaces. So, so your air fresheners can can react with atmospheric constituents and produce more formaldehyde. So it's not just primary emissions from building materials. It, it can be the infiltration of outdoor air and production via chemistry. Obviously, less of an issue now is smoking. So smoking indoors. We've obviously got radon, which I'm not an expert on, but is but is a large source of harm in indoor spaces if they're not ventilated or engineered correctly. I've highlighted already airborne disease transmission and, and the correct ventilation of indoor spaces and ensuring the, the delivery of clean air to reduce these these harms. In addition to viruses, we have we have issues with mold um, and other biologicals that might grow in badly ventilated or damp indoor spaces. And these these can produce spores as particles, and they can also produce endotoxins. And then obviously we've got we've got molecules like carbon monoxide, which come from uh, badly engineered heating devices, for example. And again, volatile organic compounds from from our paints, which which interact with other molecules, and produce formaldehyde, particulate matter, and depending on their um, identity, they can th themselves be toxic. So, you know, how an individual person will move through the day and be exposed to a number of sources of air pollution. And so we've got an example here from the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health um, report on air pollution, which was published a few years ago. And you can see as you, as you move through the day, your, your exposome, so what you're exposed to, what, what you're being affected by, um, is impacted by your your demographic, you know, your the time of day, your age, your job, you know, how you go about doing things and the environment you're in. So, so you can imagine in the morning you're impacted by um, breakfast cooking, for example, then you're going to go maybe to drop children to school and you might be all parking outside the school and dropping the kids off. So they're all impacted by um, vehicle exhaust emissions. The school is obviously quite close, possibly to where you will park your cars. And so if, if the building is not designed correctly, ventilation can, the indoor environment in the school can be impacted by those emissions from bus school buses or, or parents dropping children off. You've got, you've got the school environment for the child or at home, maybe you're at home or you're at work and you're impacted by, by those activities at home and work. And then when you get home, you've got you maybe you've got a wood burning stove you're you're producing air pollution for your your yourself and your neighbors outside but but also when you open the grate or if you've got an open fire you're producing a lot of particular matter within your own home and um, if you smoke in the home obviously you've got pets you've got cat dander and you've got your furnishings uh, emitting vocs dust and then again we've got this these emissions of formaldehyde so you know we've got we've got all these hazards and harms that that are waiting to get us all. And so how how do we how do we control risk? So I I've, I've put um, just talked about some examples really and and looked at the famous um, risk uh, hierarchy of risk triangle here. So so you know obviously at the top we we want to remove or replace sources of pollution in our environment if we can. You know, if we can do that, that's great. So can you use low VOC emission paints and fixtures and fittings? Maybe you can use hard floors and not carpets to 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 prevent resuspension of dust and accumulation of dust. Um, so these removal or replace is, is the best way to do with do with these issues. If you can't do that, what you can do is separate people from harms. So so these are called engineering controls and, and you, you might obviously in a kitchen you would put ventilation you know you might design homes so that kitchens are separate from living spaces for example so that so that children watching the tv or playing on their phones in the evening in the living room are not impacted by kitchen um, particle emissions for example 
you you might use intelligent ventilation strategies. So going back to the schools example, you might when the the sort of dropping off the kids rush hour happens, you might not be um, pumping outside air into your school, or you might put your air inlets in a, a a place where they're not impacted by diesel bus exhaust, for example. And then finally, lower down the hierarchy, we can change your behaviour. So obviously, uh, with smoking, you know, we we basically ban smoking. And um, you know, another another approach going into the office might be that you can inform occupants of buildings of the quality of air where they are, and they might be able to make informed decisions if they know enough um, as to whether or not to occupy those spaces, for example. But th these are just some some examples of of mitigation strategies. So I want to move on and just tell you about um, my research group and our facilities and what we do. And then finally, what I'm going to do is just run quickly through some projects that I've been involved in at the University of Chester and with Crest and to give you an example of how we work and what we work on. So um, what I have available to me is um, I have equipment such as this mobile laboratory. So I have a mobile laboratory and I can I can move to a location. So on site at um, an experimental location to do testing and the laboratory is equipped with um, plug in power and a generator and instrumentation for air quality measurements and a mast and weather measurements. I also have a simulated indoor environment with a measurement laboratory. So we've got two containers here. Um, one of which is a, a laid out like a kitchen environment, but we can do a number of experiments in here with cooking, ventilation strategies, and other other activities such as cleaning or maybe testing different paints out and looking at emissions. And I have a, a large suite of air quality instrumentation, instrumentation and tools for meteorology, sunlight measurements, for example, trace gas measurements of oxidized nitrogen, carbon dioxide, ozone, among others, and a, and a number of um, ways and means to measure particulate matter. So that's that's sort of my toolbox. And I've got a small team of people and we, we work on a number of projects. So I'm going to I'm just going to quickly go through some of these projects. So at the moment I'm I'm working. This is a government funded project with the universities of York and Nottingham, and we're using our simulation laboratory to look at the emissions of particles and VOCs and other molecules from cooking and cleaning. Um, and so I've got an example here, um, my postdoc Archit Mera, he, he's working on measuring the emission of fine particles from cooking. And he he measured, he took a day, he some da data from a day and we've got a we've got a time series of, of basically the number of particles. So these are these are ultra fine particles, UFP or, and so-called PM 2.5, so 2.5 micron diameter particles. So these are particles you can breathe into into your deep down into your lungs. And you can see um, while you was cooking in the home, you can see these very large peaks of, of particle emissions that are coming from cooking or other activities in the home while you while he was cooking. So quickly, quickly moving on through these projects. So so another project we have a group of projects really it's not one project so um we worked a bit with 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 andrew and edge apm evora edge um and also with funded by the university and we're looking at how to use sensor networks to manage or inform occupants about indoor air quality and we did some work last term looking at occupancy and covid19 transmission risk and so we've got an example graph here of carbon dioxide as a proxy for ventilation as a room as a classroom is being occupied by different sized classes and you and you can see we've we've estimated air change rates um, from the occupancy and we're getting a, an idea of what we would call the rebreathed fraction of air so something related to the probability if someone was infective in that room of of transmitting the virus and we, and we use a suite of sensor network technologies to try and look at can you manage indoor environments within buildings using lower cost systems that might be able to communicate with building management systems or other ventilation technologies. Another area I work on is outdoor air pollution and I have a project with a company on our campus called Motrat Race Engineering 
and we do a lot of engine testing work. So I have a student at the moment and he's developed a portable emissions um, system for cars and here it is on his car and we're doing a lot of work on making a lower cost device um, for people looking at vehicle emissions while the car is in, in use. So for example, if you, if you were to buy a proper um, system from um, PEMS system it's called, they would, they would set you back about a quarter of a million to half a million pounds. And we were designing a lower cost system um, of about five to 10,000 pounds with Motrack Race Engineering to, to enable um, you know, smaller businesses or even, even local authorities maybe to purchase such a system to, to look at fleet management. Um, and maybe engine testing, drive chain testing. Um, another census project I've been involved in, so this was with a local company, SeaTech Innovation, who were based here at Capenhurst near, near our campus, also with a local authority, looking at low cost sensors and traffic management in an air quality management zone in Chester. So this is our system being installed here um, back in 2015. And we and we were um, integrating sensor systems into traffic management systems, which um, which kind of are similar to buildings management systems in a in a strange way. But um, so that this work was funded by um, Innovate UK and one of the research councils, and and yes, was done in collaboration with a number of partners. Um, and finally, um, I work with a number of colleagues at. at at Crest down in Shrewsbury, so Professor Powell Turner, Vicky Aiton and, and Arthur Pachalski in the lab, and we're, we're looking at managing the environmental impact of intensive agriculture, and, and these are projects done with some industrial partners and farming partners um, funded by Innovate UK to look at, again, at sensor systems and um, this time barn uh, farming building management systems, so ventilation systems, um, and to, to manage emissions from farms. Okay, so I think that's enough slides and hopefully that's some food for thought.